Welcome to GovCast. I am your host, Managing Editor Amy Kluber. A physician by trade, Dr. Ryan Vega heads the Department of Veterans Affairs Center for Innovation. He oversees initiatives that aim to bring best practices across the enterprise in delivering advanced health care to our nation's veterans. These technologies are impressive. We talk 3D printing human organs, artificial intelligence, augmented reality, and more. All that the department is aiming to completely transform the health space. Ryan, thanks so much for joining us on GovCast. Great to have you today. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. You have a deep background in medicine, having you received your MD in 2011, your residency in 2014. How did you come to your current role at the VA? So I like to think of it as a serendipitous journey. Uh, some of it's probably by accident. Some of it, I think, is is by just saying yes to new opportunities. How I got into medicine is really a, a long path because I never grew up wanting to be a doctor. So when, when I was actually 12 years old, I was diagnosed with a, something called Kienbach disease. A, long story short, is a, a bone in my wrist ended up uh, dying. And I was in and out of hospitals and in and out of uh, care for about a decade I saw sort of both the fragmentation of medicine. I, I you know, distinctly remember having large binders of all of my records and then actual images, my MRI images in a folder. I remember my parents lugging that around, going to different specialists. And, and I think some of that had a big impact on, on the way that I viewed healthcare. I was certainly really fortunate to have a family that you know, had the ability not only to get me the care that I needed, but to be able to have flexible work schedules and, and, and you know, the, the availability of, of resources that so many people don't have. So I think in college, there was some things that had happened and, and uh, lost a dear friend to a tragic accident and kind of makes you pivot and, and reexamine things. And I found myself in medicine. And then from there, really, I, I think partly just finding where I fit well. Because I never was sort of geared towards being, I want to be a cardiologist or I want to be a surgeon. I just really enjoyed medicine. I really enjoyed healthcare. And, and I thought that there was opportunities to do more than just direct patient care delivery while still balancing the enjoyment that that, that brings me. And so now you're kind of doing that work for veterans. How has that transition for you to being able to be interested in medicine and then going on to helping our nation's veterans being such an important mission? Yeah, so my, my first day of internship was at a VA. Probably one of the more frightening days is, you know, you get this long white coat, you're all really excited, and then they tell you, okay, you're in charge now. And so I got the privilege of training in a VA, which so many graduate medical education uh, residents do across the country. And there was something really unique, I think, about that experience. I honestly believe that VA is on the last frontier of the true academic medical school, medical center, as I call it. And, and what I mean by that is that the ability for clinicians, providers to teach, to not feel a lot of the pressures that we see in the commercial space or even in more private academic health systems today, that you have the ability to spend time with the patients, to really teach and understand and learn. Teaching is something that I was always very much attracted to. And so I think as I thought about a career, in medicine, I really wanted to, to be in an environment that gave me the opportunity to, to feel like I was in an academic center. And then I think as I got to know the patient population even more, one of the things that, that I just was always humbled by and, and always, I think, really just overwhelmed by was the gratitude from veterans. It was really different than a, a patient population I'd ever encountered. And I remember taking care of a World War II veteran. Uh, I think I took care of him for a, a day and he thanked me for my service. You know, there's this incredible juxtaposition of an individual from the greatest generation who I should be thanking, thanking me. And I, there was really something that pulled me into that mission. And then I had a number of opportunities that, that I was fortunate enough to get a role in the VA as a chief resident for quality and safety, and then as a chief quality officer and, and now in innovation. Wow. So it kind of worked out. You are now at a department in, in the VA that is doing innovation, kind of working with some important technologies. Can you go into what that really looks like, what that department is? What does it do? How does it fit within the larger VA? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. We're a relatively new office. We call ourselves the innovation ecosystem. And I think that there's a couple of important points. So we, when we look at innovation in healthcare right now, there's this ongoing cry for more and more disruption. And if you think about it, there is some disruptive things happening, but it's probably not at the scale, the pace, at the depth of which we truly need to transform care delivery. And when I, when I speak of this, I'm speaking of healthcare writ large, not just within the VA. 
And so there's a the fundamental piece to that is the, building the foundation within the organization, and in this case, the VA, to really be able to embrace disruption. And so we start there. And our focus really is on building the workforce and building the organizational infrastructure. So the ecosystem has three portfolios. The first two, Innovators Network and Diffusion of Excellence, are really focused on that foundation. Our care and transformational initiatives, that's really where you'll see the exciting cutting-edge technology, 3D printing, augmented reality, machine learning. And we're bringing that in, but we're doing so and bringing it in a way where we have the infrastructure. We have physical spaces in medical facilities where you have subject matter experts, the clinicians, the ability to really test, incubate, and then scale. And why is that so important? Healthcare, and, and, and I always sort of think about it, not to get too scientific, but when we look at cellular environment, our cells, even within ourselves, they love homeostasis. You can actually get in a lot of trouble. We've seen, I've taken care of a lot of sick patients because their cellular environment is not homeostasis. Well, organizations, particularly healthcare organizations, don't like disruption. Right? We have things we were supposed to deliver goods and services. We can optimize those and make them better through things like Lean and Six Sigma. But when you bring something that radically disrupts my workflow or threatens the way that I believe that, that I deliver care, I'm not going to adopt it. It's one of the biggest pressing challenges with emerging tech. And we see hundreds and hundreds of emerging companies in healthcare that sort of stay static. They never really evolve. Um, and a lot of that is because we have to design solutions that incorporate into the clinical workflow that help providers be more efficient and effective, that patients understand the direct impact it's having on them uh, and how it benefits not only their care, but their whole health and their sense of being. So we really focus on not only building that foundation, but then using that foundation to accelerate innovation through the health system. Is your office, I guess, inspired by other agencies in government or vice versa? I think it's a little bit of both. So if you look at the Innovators Network and Diffusion of Excellence, some of this was started as initiatives in 2015. Coming out of the Commission of Care report, <clears throat> Diffusion of Excellence really was centered on the notion that we had really great practices, innovative solutions across the enterprise that weren't really interconnected and they weren't scaling. And the idea behind Diffusion was to create an operating model that allowed us to spread best practices more effectively and efficiently. Not something unique as a challenge to VA, but really a challenge globally in healthcare. Innovators Network took a little bit more of the early stage innovation and said, we have folks who are eager to be change agents. They're eager to catalyze innovation, but we don't have a network to support them. And we also don't have the proper training, the proper resources to invest in frontline employee ideas and then to couple that with experiential learning so that if you have a really good idea, it's really hard to bring that to fruition. But if you look to other agencies, if you look to other sectors, they invest in the workforce and things like entrepreneurship and risk-taking. For us, it may be teaching folks how to do better contracting and acquisition on smaller, large scales to be more agile and nimble. And so this is a fundamentally different way of how we approach innovation. It's generally thought about as either existing at the local level or something that's pushed down. And we know that neither of those uh, works and neither of those works in any industry in in terms of both successfully uh, sustaining an innovation culture and then allowing it to thrive. What does it mean to be at the forefront of healthcare innovation? To us, it really means two things. And so I always tell people, I look at the VA as America's health system. What do I mean by that? I think there's no more deserving population than veterans. I think a lot of these individuals have seen and borne you know, physical and emotional scars of war on behalf of us, service of us to enjoy the things that, that we hold sacred. But it also extends to their caregivers, their families. Uh, my wife uh, has a dear friend whose husband has been through five deployments. I, I can see the toll it takes on her and the kids. So they are sacrificing um, in as much as he has. And so I think when we think about being on the forefront of innovation, I think VA has a unique responsibility as America's health system to not only bring cutting edge solutions to be able to evolve and test them and to, and to sort of deliver them uh, as models of care. Um, but I think also to deliver these cutting edge solutions in real time and, and to do so at a pace uh, that exceeds what is happening in the commercial sector for our nation's heroes. And so I think part of it is not only being a leader and setting the example, uh, but it's taking the initiative to do so. What are some of the technologies or innovations and practices that came out of some of your efforts in this office? 
So there's a number. So we, we have a program called Spark Seed Spread. We look at it as sort of a venture capital model of investing in ideas. And these are frontline ideas. These are radiologists who think that there's a better way to plan for surgery by printing a CT scan or an MRI. All the way to, we have, I always forget their last names, but Michelle and Tiffany, they're two individuals that recognize that we have a whole host of veterans who weren't receiving care in the VA, and predominantly because they were part of a community, the LGBTQ community, that had a lot of difficulty navigating healthcare. I'm a provider. I'll be honest with you, if a 57-year-old male came into my clinic that identified as a female, I'd have a very difficult time discussing prostate cancer screening. So they created a 10-week course, and we've seen veterans drive two to three hours to come to these sites to receive this course. Now, these are folks that were not coming to the VA to receive care, and and I'm going to make a presumption they probably weren't receiving care anywhere else. So these are frontline ideas that are disruptive. They're, They're not better ways of doing something. They're completely new. So we use that model to find these ideas, and some of the things that have come from them are 3D printing. So Beth Ripley, who chairs our 3D printing uh, advisory and was our senior innovation fellow, really was sitting in in the radiology room one day and she was helping some uh, ear, nose and throat surgeons prepare for a complex cancer. And she said, you know, there are sites in the country that are printing models. I think we could take a CT scan or MRI and print it for you so you could actually hold the anatomy in your hand. And today, over 25 VA medical centers are using 3D printing from anywhere between pre-surgical planning. So this is making medical models to allow the surgeons to hold the patient's anatomy in their hand and prepare. And just to give you an example of how impactful this is, Beth was just telling me a story this morning where uh, there was a, a, a veteran who needed a left atrial appendage uh, closure. So it's a piece of the heart that is at risk of having blood form a clot in it, uh, but also they needed a valve replacement. They 3D printed the heart. They opened it up. They figured out exactly the size of the valve that they needed need to put in. They figured out how to close the appendage, and they did all of this in about 20 minutes, and this allowed them to do this entire procedure through what's called uh, TAVR, transaortic uh, valve replacement. This is revolutionary because even in the 3D world, even if we have virtual reality, nothing uh, replaces the ability to hold something in your hand. So that's one of the things we're really excited about. We're seeing this evolve into use cases, whether it's in prosthetics or robotics or orthotics. I think the cutting edge around 3D printing is going to be in bioprinting. And so there's a lot of work going on right now with some uh, key industry partners around uh, moving us into a direction in which uh, we will print, and I think we're probably about two to three years out, printing living tissue and eventually bone that can be bone graft implanted uh, into a patient. And I I think in our lifetime, we will see uh, living organs uh, printed. Uh, And I think that the VA is sort of in the mix of being on the cutting edge of that. Uh, Another example of some technology that I think is is really exciting uh, is the use of immersive 3D and and virtual reality, uh, but really augmented reality. And while there's a number of use cases, I think what's happening and what's really exciting about it is it's the way in which that we are engaging with data in a fundamentally different way. So right now, if you think about data that's in an EMR, if you think about a medical image, I'm interacting with it uh, in sort of my three-dimensional space, but it's very static. It's very binary. Imagine taking a CT scan, putting it in sort of a hollow lens glass, and layering it over the patient. So as I'm in the operating room or in the interventional room, instead of the common practice of looking at the patient, then turning to look, excuse me, look at a screen of the MRI or the CT scan, looking back, I'm actually now making the data a physical object that I can interact with. And this is fundamentally changing the way that we're going to approach procedures in the operating room and the intervention room by taking data that's just there and making it into a physical object in my reality. Um, and so those are two things I think that are pretty cutting edge uh, that I'm, I'm really excited to see how they evolve in advance. Wow, that's amazing. What did you learn during your time as a, a resident or in your practice in medicine that you apply in your current role? I think there's a couple of important things. So I had a a mentor I'm very fond of. He used to call this notion of clinical care delivery, he he used to say it's the mechanics of care and the mechanism of disease. And what he meant by that was that there's 
all of these things we do in the day to just get through the day. There's notes, there's order entries, there's consults, there's the mechanics of how we deliver care. But there are these mechanisms, there's these people behind the conditions that they have. And you have to stop and take a step back and recognize what problem are you trying to solve. So I'll give you an example. You know, evidence-based medicine is one of those things that we could probably talk about for days and can be controversial at times. Really, what we're trying to do is take the best evidence we had and deliver it to an individual. We don't always get that right. And so I think we have to remember that we need to engage patients in these discussions. So now as you start to hear more about consumer-driven healthcare, patient-centered care, it's really about asking the, the individual, what do you want? right? If you and I were to go have a knee replacement, and I'm hoping neither of I need that soon, what you would expect coming out of it is very different than what I would expect. Now, we both expect that the surgery would be successful, but perhaps you enjoy running. Perhaps I enjoy swimming. The mechanics are going to be the same, but the mechanisms of what happens after are going to be very, very different. So I think what I learned was that we have to solve problems with patients, not for not by, but with them, which means bringing in human-centered design into everything that we do. It's not good enough to say, here's a solution for you. It's to say, does this solution meet your needs? And I think the other really most important thing was that in order to get this right, to really embrace disruption, we really have to remember that healthcare is complex, it's busy, it's challenging, and that clinicians, providers, those on the front lines, they have a lot going on. We have to make sure that all of these solutions that are being developed and designed not only are doing so in conjunction with them, but make them more effective, make them more efficient, that we consider how disruptive things could be to the, the work that they do, and we work with them through those processes. I think those two things have been incredibly invaluable lessons that I try to bring to the work that we do every day. So you mentioned a couple things, human-centered design, and then um, earlier back you mentioned debt data engagement, which I thought was interesting. What is it about the VA that I guess makes it a conducive environment or organization to do some of this work? So so data engagement, I think, is an, an interesting concept. And let's take AI, for example. A lot of people are getting really excited about what the future of AI holds. But I, I think we have to sometimes take a step back and remember, 70% of health outcomes are attributed to your genetic makeup, and your behavior. Now, that means that 70% of the data that we really need to drive good predictive models on outcomes, and I'm thinking even more prescriptive models, we don't have them in the EMR. Uh, the EMR is a data set of episodic, discrete, sometimes binary data points. And so I can tell a lot about patterns of when an individual is sick, but to truly think about how we engage with data that's sitting on my phone. My phone tells me more about my behavior than is in an EMR. It tells me how many steps I took, how active I am. And so I think it's how we engage with all of these data models and data sets that exist outside of the EMR and how we bring them and make sense of all of these to really move forward things like artificial intelligence to really better understand machine learning and, and predictive analytics. So I think how we engage with the data is, in, is incredibly important. And why I think VA is so conducive is, is because we have such enormous opportunity to leverage real big data sets data sets that I think are not found uh, on any scale, at least to my knowledge, in U.S. healthcare. And I think the longitudinal nature of it going back years and years and years gives us an unprecedented opportunity going forward, particularly as we modernize our systems and move to a single record with DOD. You mentioned your innovation superpower is leadership. <laughs> Why did you pick that word? I'm not very innovative. So I had to struggle and say, well, what, what do I think that I have to offer what I think about in leadership is is my responsibility is to to develop those around me and to make sure that they have the resources and that they have the safe space to test and to to ability to fail and to try again. So I think what my responsibility is and what my superpower is, and for lack of better words, is I've had just incredible opportunities in my career to grow as a leader, uh, to learn from people I think that are true leaders and to be around individuals who have given me that same opportunity. They've given me the opportunity to fail and to learn from those failures. They've given me the opportunity to, to try ideas that some worked, some didn't. And so what I try to bring is the same opportunities that were given to me is to repay those forward. 
And so I use that and the platform that I have to try to build those up around me, whether it's an individual in the field who has a you know left field idea about how to better deliver suicide prevention, all the way from somebody who says, look, uh, I think we can use artificial intelligence to better understand predictive modeling around uh, prescription drug benefits, which is an example that came into our Shark Tank actually last year. So that's my responsibility. I, you know, I've been blessed to have some really good opportunities to learn from some great leaders. So I'm just trying to translate that back. Can you go into the Shark Tank competition? I'm actually a big fan of the TV show. Yeah. So <laughs> it's a really fun event. Um, one of the things that's challenging is, is in an organization the size of the VA, how do you find all of the great practices going on? Do so in a fun manner that not only energizes the field, but allows those individuals who are driving these practices access to what we consider is a singular event. So there's great things going on locally. We encourage that. Great things going on invisibly. But, but how do you create this national competition to source these really good ideas? And so the idea came is that well, we could do something like an employee competition. If you take that a step further, what's really, I think, unique about the Shark Tank model that we use is that the medical centers who are going to be replicating these practices are the ones that are bidding. So from an economic perspective, you're really – aligning incentives financially because now a medical center is only going to buy something that they truly think that they need. But if they're going to buy something and invest in it, then they're going to own it. So the likelihood that these replications are successful is higher when you sort of have that upfront investment of capital from a medical center and the leadership to say, I'll put resources into the, getting this practice at my site. So that was sort of the same concept on the Shark Tank, that these investors or uh, Mark Cuban or whoever it may be is going to put a million dollars into a company. Not only do they believe in it, but they also have a vested interest in it now. Um, and so it was a different approach to scaling innovation and practices was to really align those. And then I think making it open to all employees, it's amazing to see even the ones that don't get selected, just write us and tell us how enjoyable the opportunity was because it's giving them a platform uh, to say, hey, look, I'm, I'm doing some really good work and I just want somebody to recognize it. What kind of feedback have you gotten from that, whether it's the medical centers or the public? Yeah, it's it's really evolved over time and we try to try to continuously get better. I think one of the big things that we have learned is, and, th and this is an important part about implementation, medical centers, as they are thinking about implementing practices, we really didn't do a good enough job of helping them plan for who's the right team on your site to really lead this implementation. We have a very fast-paced expectation. We expect that these practices are replicated in six to seven months. That is a uh, accelerated timeline for some of these practices. So we're asking for a very heavy lift. And what we've really learned is that it's so important to have the right team and we've evolved now to having what we call diffusion base camp. So it's some play on words. We have diffusion base camp. And then when they finish, they reach the summit. Base camp brings together these medical centers, these teams in a one week course where we really allow them to sit in a room and we help them work through the implementation strategy, making sure that it's agile enough to adopt a new culture. So we've learned not only the importance of finding the right people, but then bringing those individuals together to really prepare for that six month journey. Uh, and I think public perception has been, uh, been incredible. We have a couple of publications out in some academic journals about the model. And I think people are really interested. You know, one of the comments I always get when I explain this is people look at me and they go, there's no way VA is doing that. So I think it's sometimes it's met with a, a healthy dose of skepticism because it doesn't seem like a government agency would be that forward leaning and progressive. But I'm excited that we are. The VA overall, it's going through, I guess, a lot of modernization. How does your office fit into that? And where do you see it, I guess, growing maybe in the next five years? So I go back to the comments we made earlier about the importance of the innovation foundation and the culture. We are going through a lot of modernization efforts. And one of the biggest things about innovation cultures is that they're resilient. And we know, and I'm probably biased, but I know the capabilities of, of a new EMR and what this means for our innovation future. And, I, and I'm just so incredibly excited at this effort. But I also know the realities that there's going to be changes along the way. Part of what our office is focused on is in building that infrastructure, the organizational capability to bring in emerging tech, to bring in cutting edge solutions with industry partners, to not just 
take them in and then scale them, but to co-develop them, to co-develop them within the, the operation center. So the VA medical center, even within a visit, um, and then to have those frontline employees who are not only change agents who can help drive some of this change, um, but who are resilient, who have the skills and the necessary capabilities. So that's a big aspect. We can't lose sight of the importance of that. And then I think the next piece is going to be around what we call our care and transformational initiatives, really accelerating 3D, accelerating AI and, and augmented reality. I think the EMR is going to give us an, an unprecedented ability not to innovate because I think VA has always been innovating. It's the scale and the pace at which we're going to be able to innovate nationally uh, that really excites me. Now, part of these with modernization, part of the issue becomes security concerns. How does the innovation ecosystem look at security? When when does that come into play? It's a fantastic question. I'll come back to it. I want to focus a little bit on that because I think this is an important conversation societally for us to have. What we need to reframe the conversation is is about trust in, in data. So I'm sure you're familiar with what's going on right now between Google and Ascension. And I think that that that's only the start because we have an incredible responsibility in, in healthcare to continuously push the boundaries on delivering the highest quality care, reducing waste across the, the U.S. I think the recent study I saw from Optum said that about 25% of U.S. healthcare spending is wasteful spending. When you're talking about a multi-trillion dollar industry, that's a lot of money. And data holds a unique power, a unique ability to help us gain better insights. But it, the patient owns the data, not the hospital, not the health system. The patient owns the data. So the conversation we need to have is how do we create trust that the data is being used to advance healthcare delivery globally, to take all of these amazing data sets and understand both the socioeconomic uh, and social determinants impact and how we better move healthcare further upstream in the care delivery. So not in treating a heart attack, but actually preventing it. And, and I think this is a fundamental shift. It's a paradigm shift in the role of healthcare, but centered on that is going to be data sharing, uh, but it also has to be about the public trust in the use of that data. So that's a really important conversation that we need to be having because we see this playing out where really good intentions um, are going to be thwarted by concerns around privacy and security. We innovate in one of our, our core portions in the ecosystem is about mission-driven innovation, but innovation that restores trust in the veteran. Everything we do has to be about considering their privacy, their concerty, and making sure that we're ensuring trust. So let's take 3D printing. If I print a medical model of somebody's heart, I have to talk to the patient and say, are you comfortable with me using your medical model for teaching purposes. Now, we, we may not think about that medical model as being data, but it is the patient's data. It's their heart. It is a replica of a CT scan, which we all would consider being the patient's data. So as we move and get into these great advancements about 3D printing and I can create medical models, I'm just taking your data and making it to a physical object. How do I ensure that that's used for purposes of advancing healthcare or education, training, or research. And I'm doing so in ensuring you that those are the cases in which I'm going to use it. That's about creating trust and showing and delivering value to the veteran, to the, the patient of how we're using that data. So again, I think it's about how we engage with the data. Data management is a piece of that, but our, our trust that we show and how we engage with it and the uses of it is both a societal question that we have to tackle. And I think in the ecosystem, we've been uh, very conscientious about it because to be frank, you know, if I printed a 3D model of your heart, you may not consider that to be your data, but I just took your data and made it into a physical object. I think the other concern that people have with this idea of data engagement is when it can be used against you. So when I can start to recognize that based upon your genetic profile or your patterns of behavior, there's nothing I can do to change that you're going to have worse outcomes than everyone else. And I start using that against whether it's selective surgeries or selective uh, insurance companies saying that, well, we're going to charge you more because you're, you cost more. I think I hear that a lot in the general public about concerns of how this data is going to potentially be used. And again, I think it's about how we engage with it and how we demonstrate trust. 
Well, thank you so much, Ryan. This was a great conversation. I was really glad to learn more about your office and all these cool things. I'll be watching from afar. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having us. Great. Thank you. GovCast is a production of Government CIO Media and Research. For more podcasts, head to governmentcio.com slash podcasts. GovCast is produced and hosted by Amy Kluber. It is edited by Resonate Recordings. Theme music provided by Big Hoax. If you're interested in sponsoring a podcast, contact us at sponsor at governmentcio.com. Governmentcio.com.